Happy New Year, everybody. It's only April, <laughs> and this is our first episode of the year. Welcome to the ABT Time podcast, which fell a little bit off the truck in the past few months. The last episode we did was in November. It's just been a very busy year as we're going to go through here. We got lots to do. This is episode 55, and in fact, we're about to uh, do four episodes in the next probably three weeks. We're going to do this one, and then we're going to do a three-part series that will be really fascinating on uh, two case studies, one from North Dakota, one from Australia, and then a discussion of um, looking at those two stories through the lens of the ABT model. So tons and tons to catch up. The last episode was in November. And the first thing I want to talk about is the propagation of the ABT model. We have been hard at it now. I've been hard at it for probably 12 to 14 years. I would say it was 2013 when I gave the TED Med talk that really was kind of the first big introduction of it. Um, lots of progress. It's getting wider and wider use. It just takes time. And it's not one of these things that will go viral. And, and part of the reason I know that is because it's very similar in the term with the term shifting baselines, which 2002 I wrote an editorial that was published in the LA Times, an op-ed piece about this new term, shifting baselines. It had been coined in 1995 by a fisheries biologist, Daniel Pauly. My buddy, Jeremy Jackson, began explaining it to me, saying, don't you think this has got broader implications for really everything in our lives? It's the idea of losing track of the past. Um, I finally wrote the editorial, and when it was published, there was only one mention of this term, shifting baselines, I could find on the internet at that point. It was one fishing club in florida that made a mention of changes in fish populations beyond that there was nothing today you can look at the wikipedia page for shifting baselines more importantly just search the term and you'll find pages and pages of websites and websites and lots of papers and books and things like that that we definitely achieved our goal with it we propagated this term throughout the the world of conservation biology and environmentalism that was the main goal and in fact, if you look at that Wikipedia page, you can see that the, the account sort of starts with talking about my my editorial there. Um, we had hoped it would go viral. It did not. It just took a slow build. That's what happens when you're dealing with something that has got more substance to it. There was a term that came out a couple of years later, which is the new normal that did spread rapidly. And that's in common parlance today used all over the place. But it's not nearly as powerful. New, the new normal doesn't tell you anything to work on in the past. Shifting baselines points you right to, you've got to dig in on what are the baselines and how have they changed. It's a more analytical term. As a result, it's slower to propagate, but it's more powerful in the long term and tells us a lot more. So that's all very parallel to what we've seen with the ABT model, which is, I had wondered in the beginning when I gave, actually the first talk was in January 2012 to a 1,000 ocean scientists in Anchorage, Alaska, and a whole crowd came up afterwards and said, oh my goodness, you know, this ABT thing, we've never heard this before. And I thought, maybe this is something that could kind of go viral. But pretty quickly, I began to realize, no, the ABT will never go viral. It, it, it takes a lot of thought. Um, as a result, it's very powerful because there's so much substance to it. But, you know, it's not storytelling. It's getting deeper than storytelling. It's looking at narrative structure, this tripartite structure inside of how we communicate and as a result, it takes time to pick it up, takes time to really master it. And But once you do, it's something you'll never let go of. So that's where we are right now with the journey with the ABT, which is lots and lots of groups. As a matter of fact, we've now um, had three forms of training that have risen out of the 11 books I have now written about communication, in which most of them are about the ABT. So we had an initial model that came out of my Houston, we have a narrative book in 2015, and we did that for five years. We did, I think, a, a hundred different rounds of story circles. And it was all in, it, it all began in person with our demo days. So tons and tons of fun with all that. And probably a couple thousand people went through the story circles training program. Then the pandemic hit in 2020 and really mandated that we had to change the model because we couldn't do things in person anymore. That was when we began the ABT course, which Matt and I have been running intensively now for four years. It's been an incredible journey. As a matter of fact, we're in April now, 2024, making exactly four years. The first round of it we did in April of 2020, just as the pandemic was setting in, and we put a little announcement on Twitter on a Monday and wondered if we could fill 50 slots. And by the Friday, we'd fill them all up and realize, wow, there really is an audience uh, ready to, to dig in on this. 
we've now run that course 40 times and we ended up with four guest faculty members, each of whom probably gave their presentation 25 to 30 times, I would say. It's been a tremendous course. Uh, last time we did it was last fall with Emory University Medical School, and we'll probably do it with them again this fall. But for the most part, um, it kind of hit limitations with the, the Zoom world, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And so now we have morphed into a new form of training, which is the DayBT, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. So we started the DayBT last year. And now we'll be doing it for the indefinite future. And this is what we're going to get into today. We've got special guest joining us who is our uh, quantification expert for the new DayBT training. And here's a little flyer that we put together for anybody watching on the, the YouTube version of this podcast, which gets into the, um, the three new elements that we get with the DayBT training. So the DayBT, um, instead of going for 10 one-hour sessions, it goes for three weeks. And number one, there's no obligatory Zoom sessions. That was really something that was great during the pandemic when people had tons of time, they were stuck at home and they really kind of cherished this opportunity to join a group on Zoom for an hour. But as the pandemic ended, we began to hear back, especially from some of the government agencies that everybody had just done enough of the Zoom time and were burned out. And so we, you know, it's important to listen. That's one. <laughs> that's going to be the the key dynamic of the next three episodes as we get into these case studies is the failure to listen. So we've done the best we can to listen to folks. And as a result, we morphed into this new training, which um, first off has no obligatory Zoom sessions. Uh, as a matter of fact, it almost has nothing obligatory other than you send in your ABTs uh, for us to analyze. Secondly, it has this um, quantitative element that we've developed at the beginning of this year. That's what we're going to dive into because I think it's very, very cool. Uh, nobody's ever come up with a quantitative way to look at narrative structure and to guide people in getting better with narrative structure. It's very powerful. And then thirdly, um, they, we've got this fun exercise we put together called the ABT Hot Seat, and that becomes a part of the training. So the weekly schedule for it is on um, for your group. If you book it on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, all you do is uh, Matthew sends out a queuing email that asks you to send in your uh, one sentence ABT of the day. And so, and you can write your ABTs on anything. It can be about the TV show you watched the night before. Or it can be about your dog, who knows what. It's just to get you into this daily rhythm. This this really kind of arose from our good buddy, Leo Russo, uh, Russo at Pfizer, the head of their global medical epidemiology group we've been working with for a couple of years. And he had said to me that, you know, my people don't spend that much time writing proposals and papers and giving presentations. The main thing they're doing is all day, every day, communicating verbally of what's going on with their projects. And we really need help with trying to get that communication into a more concise form so that people don't go on and on and on in the and, and, and mode. And out of that, I began thinking, it took me a few months, I began to come up with this idea of this DayBT training. And so that's what it does. And as a result, we've got this one exercise that happens in each of the three weeks of the hot seat. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all you do is you send in one email and we gather all those and analyze them. And in a bit, we're going to have our guest, um, Haley, join us. And that's her role in the group is that she's our official quantifier of the the daily ABTs that everybody writes in this training. On Thursday, there's this optional one hour session called the hot seat where we pull everybody together on Zoom and Matthew leads it and cues everybody with these questions, uh, with just simple questions. You know, right now, off the top of your head, give us the one sentence ABT of the worst movie you've ever seen. And this is to help people use the ABT in a real world setting. We've heard from a number of people, they've gotten so much value out of it being in a group that's, you know, everybody's reporting in and somebody turns to them and says, you know, in a minute, we want you to tell us what's going on with your group for the past couple of months. And to be able to formulate that instantly into the tripartite structure of setup problem solution that the ABT gives you is a, a real strength and asset rather than just rambling and going on a bunch of things to take people on a little arc that is focused like that. And that's what happened. We've had a few people tell us those sorts of stories like, wow, everybody in the room was riveted and came up later. Like you were so clear when you did that. Yeah, that's the power of the ABT. So the hot seat session on Thursday, then we go to work and we do a couple things with the ABTs for that week. So all of the ABTs are pulled together that everybody sent in. And 
the first thing we do is our group member, Devo Brown, who has been working with us for a couple of years, and he's one of our structuralists, he takes a look at all the, the DBTs and comes up with qualitative comments on here's some basic patterns I'm seeing and how people are putting these ABTs together and they're kind of missing the mark on this or that. You know, they're failing to get the singular narrative and things like that. Um, then for the quantitative side, Haley steps in and she does these three questions that I'm going to tell you about in detail. And that is really the novel thing where we then can give you a number on how your group is doing for each of these different dynamics. And you can begin to work on that and improve over the course of the three weeks. So that is the basic structure of the DBT training. And now to kind of catch up on what's gone on since last November when we disconnected um, with the, <laughs> the um, podcast and just kind of buried our heads in and doing all this work. So in the fall, we developed the beginnings of the DBT training. It wasn't until January that we came up with the quantitative element to add to it that I think has jumped it up another level. We ran it in the fall with global health labs in Seattle who've become one of our major partners. And that is an organization of about 120 people that's funded by the Gates Foundation for their work in global health. It's kind of their innovation lab where they develop all the technologies and techniques and communication is a fundamental part of the work they do. Then we also did a round of DBT with the World Bank with about 65 people from mostly their South Asia uh, groups. And in January, Matthew was invited to um, Vilnius University in Lithuania. And you want to give us a little rundown on what you <laughs> experienced in Lithuania? Oh, absolutely. Uh, first off, um, as great and beautiful as Lithuanian was, as much as I loved Old Town, uh, Old Town Vilnius, Randy, next time, let's not send me there in the middle of January, maybe. <laughs> let's uh, not send me to Eastern Europe at a high elevation in the middle of winter. How cold um, was it? Oh, my God. Uh, they, I don't I don't really know because they use this like Celsius thing, So, but cold. <laughs> we weren't raised on that. Yeah, exactly. I, I have no idea what they were talking about, uh, at least in that respect, because everyone spoke perfect English like the entire time. So that was great. But uh, I remember before we went, like you and I had this like big question. Um, will Eastern Europe resonate with the ABT? Will they get it? Will they, will they click with it? And will they understand it? And the answer was a resounding yes across the board. Uh, my, so the, the week kind of broke down. I gave like a big intro lecture on Tuesday and then Wednesday and Thursday were a bunch of like uh, smaller workshops. Uh, I've never seen the smaller workshops so packed before. Usually I just get like the minimum number of people there who want to work on their ABTs, but there was actually like an audience there to like watch the process and watch it develop, which was really cool. But there was this one moment when I realized that I'd really like kind of like broken through. And it was when like during one of the workshops, uh, after I'd finished like working with this professor on his ABT, he said, you know, Matthew, I've been working I've been using actually the three part structure for writing for like the past 15 years of my research papers. I've been, I've been doing it this thesis, antithesis, synthesis style for like years and years and years, paper after paper. But I realized I've been doing it wrong this entire time after you explained the heaven part of the Matthew template, after you explained that we're supposed to explicitly state what good things were expected to happen if everything goes according to plan. I realize I, I've been missing that for 15 years. I'm like, yep, sorry, buddy. That's the way it goes. And therefore... Uh, and therefore he's going to start doing it here to the future and telling it everyone else to start doing it too. everyone else to start being very, very explicit about that. And so, you know, that that's, that's the power of the, the Matt template of just the simple heaven before hell. Basically. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. that's boiling it all the way down to just a little phrase there and just getting that one piece of, of intuition programmed into people. Uh, give us so, seven before you take us to hell. Exactly. And, and Randy, here's what I'm, I've been trying to struggle with like the past couple of months. Why is it so hard for people to include that heaven part? Because I've seen time and time again in the class, we will preach over and over again. You have to be explicit. You have to really state why the audience should care. Why is this important? And we get that into their heads and they seem to get it but they might come back to us later and then have completely forgotten about it. It's like completely wiped out of their heads. Well, and that, that, that element of why is this important is going to come up when we talk with Haley in a few minutes, because that's right. one of the elements of, of that stuff. Yeah. Keep going. 
Uh, but I'm wondering if you have any theories as to like why it just that that's yeah. so hard for to stick with people. Yeah. Um, because know. because even if you go back to that Nicholas Kristoff article in Outside Magazine, Nicholas Kristoff's uh, advice on how to save the world, uh, yeah. he really explicitly states that it's the positive. It's the positive what we're going to get out of it that social science has said, this is what works. This is what convinces people. So- but, but, you, but you know what? What he doesn't go into in that article is that the sequence matters. Mm. Um, and if you put the positive at the end, after you've pounded everybody into depression with yeah. the problems, and, then, and that's what environmentalists have traditionally done, you know, but there's still hope. It's too <laughs> late. You pounded us down into, we already gave up on hope. And once we gave up on it, you can't just suddenly light it again. Yeah. So it's that flipping of the order and understanding and respecting that. Um, and I think I would attribute right off the top of my head um, a lot of that to two things. First of which is the second chapter of my first book, Don't Be So Literal Minded. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the default state for everybody's brain is just be literal minded. You know, we got a problem. We got a problem. It really is more non-literal to begin with. Let's talk about, you know, someday we could have a world that looks like this and this. But right now right. we've got this problem that is less literal minded. And, and again, you know, environmentalists have just been knee jerkers from day one. Well, not, I don't know about from day one. You know, I think that there was a shift. Um, that's a whole separate story. Mark Dowie's book, Losing Ground, the 1980s and 90s, how the, the mindset of the Amer- American environmental movement shifted. Mm. But it's that problem of people just, um, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. I, and I th- actually, you know, okay, now we're making up stuff as we go along. <laughs> but I think that there, there really was a shift. And I think that shift was driven by the information explosion in the 1980s uh, that I mm. lived through. And what that did was that that took away context. And this is what we're learning with the ABT is that context is the blue material up front. It's the heaven part. Yep, yep, and yep, that yep. is really tough to, to get that in there. And when you get into a world of too much information where everybody's screaming and shouting, they don't give you the time to, to present context and everybody then just defaults right to the contradiction. So I think that's that's a driving force. And, and you know, my overarching statement about everything to do with society is that none, none of it makes sense except in the light of the information explosion. It's what I've witnessed in my life. There was a different way of thinking and living that I grew up in that doesn't exist today because of what information propagation has done to us. Everybody thinks differently today and on and on and on with that. So I think I would go with that one um, to begin with. And the second thing is what we know and we preach in the ABT, which is that all the power lies in the contradiction. Contradiction is what lights up. Mm. And so again, you know, everybody's inclined to just let's go right to the thing that's going to light people's brains up. And of course, that's what journalists do with their inverted pyramid model is they begin with the contradiction. They begin with six people were killed uh, right from the start before they try to feed you some context. That's the fundamental divide between what we're propagating here with the the ABT, which is basically three act structure um, in a more analytical version versus the inverted pyramid of journalists. So that's, I think, what I would give for a shot at that. Um, Yeah. Stay with us here. Let's keep going on the... um, so the quantitative PCI index is when we developed that in January, began to use it. The first group that we used it with was the National Park Service um, the ABT training. We'll get into that in a bit with Haley. Then um, February, what did we do? We ran a, another round of uh, our first round with the GH Labs group using the ABT. In March, Matthew set to work on developing his new project, around um in developing a twitch channel Uh, give us a little rundown on what you're doing with that yes so basically i found that what i really really enjoy doing with this abt stuff is the coaching aspect i love going to vilnius i love going to uh bangkok or caltech or wherever and working with people one-on-one i love doing that but i wasn't doing that enough so i was like "Hmm, how can i keep doing this more working with people on their abts on their narratives and still kind of like have that audience aspect to it because uh the audience aspect is great because you get all these extra points of view coming in lots of people chipping in pitching in lots of brain power going forward to try to help people improve their narratives i was like well where can i do that in this day and age twitch not just for video games people it's not i swear to god what what, so, it, what is twitch uh, i don't know about <laughs> twitch. please explain it to me so twitch is basically youtube with an emphasis on two things live it's all about live streaming not pre-recorded live and two 
audiences. It's very much focused on audience participation. Like there's a lot of creators on Twitch who are actively talking to their chat room. And it's like this back and forth conversation with, uh, it's a dialogue. It's like part host, part chat, kind of guiding where the discussion goes. And that is what makes Twitch so valuable. It's not just a monologue, me into the camera. It's a back and forth discussion and who knows what can happen from that. So that's why I'm very excited about Twitch because that's more reflective of how the workshops go. It's not just and me what talking. And what will you be doing on this Twitch channel? I am going to be having guests on. Uh, I want to have like environmentalists, conservationists, people who are working in global health, grad students, PhD students. And I want to have them on and help them with their narrative live in front of a Twitch audience with the Twitch audience chipping in for suggestions on how to improve all these narratives. My overarching goal, my my ultimate goal, Randy, is to save the world with narrative. And, uh, <laughs> this is my this is my first step toward doing that. He's on a narrative mission. So excellent. Yes. All right, we, we'll start getting the word out about that. And anybody and everybody is invited to join in there. And the other thing we did in March was put together a new video with GH Labs. It was uh, just a short little three-minute video with five of their people talking about how they are using the ABT now and applying it to their communication, particularly internal communications there at GH Labs because they do more of that. But a, a couple of them also talk about uh, presentations they've given at the Gordon Conference. And um, was it Charles talked about the presentation he gave last November at a big machine learning conference and abt the hell out of his whole presentation. And everybody came up in a daze like, wow, this is the greatest thing ever. Actually, on that note, um, Diana Padilla, who is one of our four guest speakers in the course, wrote to me a couple of weeks ago about a big talk she had just given where she used the ABT top to bottom and people came up and said it was the best talk they'd ever heard her give. So we, we get those testimonials constantly from people putting it to work. Uh, in April, we are now in, um, we're now implementing the with GH Labs as our model organization. And this has been the vision, basically, and we're just getting it started up there now, which is the idea of engaging in the narrative gym in the form of quarterly training. This is what someday I would hope that lots of organizations would want to do if they really do value, value effective communication, that they first off accept that you can't learn this stuff one and done. You can't do a one day workshop, one afternoon workshop at your annual science meeting and somehow, miraculously, people learn how to do this any more than you could do a one-day weightlifting workshop once a year, and somehow everybody thinks they're going to become buff. It is an ongoing, constant thing, but communication is that important. And so we're starting to move in that direction with GH Labs in Seattle. Um, they they have now set up for this year to do the quarterly training. So we already did the first quarter. We're now in the second quarter, April. And so next week, Matthew and I will be going to Seattle um, for the week to work with them in person. And they're actually starting their uh, their second quarter DBT training right now. Then we'll do the whole thing again in July and then the whole thing again in October. So every quarter running this for three weeks of getting as many people as possible to join in together and just work on ABT for three weeks. And it's not a huge commitment. It's not like night and day. It's just a few minutes, but it's hearing it every day for three weeks. Oh, yeah, it's time to send in your one sentence ABT that took you all of one minute to write up. Just activating the narrative part of your brain each day like that. That's how you begin to develop intuition, narrative intuition. That's what you need to communicate effectively. There's no getting around that. There's no other pathway that I could imagine that could make you into a really powerful communicator if you don't have a grasp on how narrative structure works. So towards that note, um, one little side anecdote I want to toss in because this is going to come up in one of these three episodes we're about to embark on. Um, and this is an anecdote from a buddy of mine last week who's the head of a major ocean conservation group who kind of wrote to me, you know, I get these emails from friends from time to time that just are kind of kvetching about and look at how we're blowing it now. And this is about the issue on the East Coast that's at full tilt right now, the the conflict between um, wind energy projects, especially offshore wind energy projects, the big turbines that they're building, um, especially around Massachusetts, and the idea of whale deaths. So the wind energy is, it, it's something that's got to be developed to combat climate change. We know this. It's a fundamental part of strategy with climate change. Problem is, it's in competition with the fossil fuel industry, which we know has enormous resources and will go to great lengths to try and 
defend their industry at the expense of stomping on renewables. And that's what's going on there in this conflict. There was an article that came out um, there. I think Science Friday did a segment on an NPR. And that was what my friend had sent me the article associated with that. And here's what he said was, you know, here's the basic situation that's going on right now, which is them, meaning the fossil fuel industry, is saying wind energy projects are killing whales and us, the pro alternative energy sources, wind energy, are answering with it's complicated. And you can't do that. People can't follow it's complicated in the mass communication world. Uh, how many times can we say this? And this is the challenge is finding the singular narrative. They found their singular narrative, which the environmentalists are saying is very dishonest. What they're doing is every time a whale dies now, they're finding some way to blame it on these turbines and the wind energy when in fact it's it's unrelated. Most of them are strandings or uh, entanglements from fishing gear and things like that. And they're they're running big misinformation campaigns and the problem is that the environmental crowd is coming back with it's complicated. You know, it, it's, uh, you just can't do that. You've got to put together a strategy. This is where the ABT becomes the central tool to help you find what is that singular narrative? What's the what's your butt bomb on and on? This is what we work with people on. So and this answer of it's complicated is what cropped up in Australia in conversation I had a couple of days ago about the um, second case study we'll be doing in these upcoming three episodes. So that's why I wanted to toss that out right now. Okay. And now that leads us to the last part of this episode, which is to get into a little bit of depth about this um, PCI analysis we're calling. This is now the quantitative approach we're taking in doing the DBT training with groups. And all that this is, it's nothing that sophisticated. And it sounds, PCI sounds, oh, it makes you think of PCR or something like that. Sorry, but we had to give it some sort of name. But it's just looking at three elements of your ABT and trying to push you to work on those. To It's all about strengthening your ABT. Everybody can come up with a simple and but therefore first draft uh, sentence. That's what you do. Then you go to work in strengthening it. And that's where we come in and help you do that. So what we've come up with are three simple questions to ask of your ABT. Once you put it together, here's the first question. Did you do a good job of making sure that your problem is in the red material in the second section. So it's and, but therefore set up problem solution. And you want the problem to be entirely in that second part. I mean, we color code them blue, then red, then green. And so the red part is the problem and you want everything to do with the problem to be there. Um, sometimes people make the mistake of, of saying the problem up front. That's what Matt was just talking about is people going right to hell, so to speak, going right to what the problem is. You don't want to do that. So that's the first question is, did you do a good job of making sure that you only had the problem material in the red? Second question is what the blue material is supposed to be. Did you make sure that all the, the setup material is there in the blue material and not scattered in the other sections? And the third question is, did you up front in the blue material in the first section address why your work is important, ideally with the if-then tool. And so that's these are the things that we choose to go into and in working with these groups now with the DBT training. Um, so here is our quantifier now. Um, Haley, if you want to join me and we'll talk a little bit about all of this and what you've been doing with us. First off, how in the world did you get involved with the ABT project? <laughs> um, I actually was just kind of stumbled across the ABT through my rhetoric advisor, um, in college, I majored in astronomy and rhetoric, which was not a common combination of majors. I think I was the first humanities science major combination they had in like 10 years. And at what so, university was this? At Whitman College. Which is where? Um, in Walla Walla, Washington. Um, and everyone was pretty excited to finally have another STEM and humanities major combination um and my rhetoric advisor introduced me to your book houston we have a narrative which is where i first stumbled across someone talking about all the frustrations that i was feeling about the science writing world um and actually was doing things to try and combat it so within a few days of buying and reading your first book i read and well i bought um don't be such a scientist because I was so enthralled with this idea. And, and, and you know what? Let's let's make a note right there, which is that you and I converged on the contradiction there. 
You know, it wasn't the joys of communication that brought you into the stuff. It was that it was, it's the butt, you know, you read what I had to say and, you know, communication is great and science great when scientists get this, but sometimes it can be really tough and that's what pulled you in. Right. And that was that first email you sent to me was, yeah, I feel your pain. Um, that's the unifying power of the singular narrative, the, the contradiction. So yeah, keep going. Yeah. Um, and I, just ended up reading both of your books I think within like two or three weeks um and I loved all the stuff you talked about so much I ended up going and pursuing an independent study for my last semester about scientists like science communications so that I could figure out what I was feeling about it just because your books were so relatable for me and that was the first <laughs> exposure I had ever had to the ABT Great. And, and then what you do that resulted in your getting <laughs> shackled and yanked into this project without even asking for it. I sent you an email. <laughs> <laughs> and how soon after you sending that, after hitting send, did you end up on Zoom talking to me? <laughs> um, Maybe an hour. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if I'm being generous. <laughs> I mean, that's what happens. I get a really cool email like that and I can instantly tell this is somebody who gets this and we're not going to let her get away. And that was what happened was I sent you back instantly. Please get on Zoom right now. Here's the link. I'm on here now. You got on there. And then I contacted Matthew and Mike Strauss, two of our long-term folks, had them join us. And then I had to go after half an hour and they talked to you for another half an hour. And then they reported back to me and said, this is a complete match. She's got to be part of the project. Um, and the rest was history from there. Um, and so now you are living in Seattle. And what we've done is I began to develop this quantification uh, approach with you for the ABT, and um, you're the perfect person to jump in to do it. Um, what are you, you're, you're teaching, uh, you're substitute teaching high school right now in Seattle? Yes, yeah. yeah. And you graduated when from Whitman last year? I graduated in 2022, so right. almost two years ago. Okay, great. Um, okay, and so this is how it works, is that I mentioned we've got these three parameters, uh, the P, the C, and the I. And so when we start in on the DBT training, we've got the first week, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, everybody in the group produces an ABT. So the round that we ran with National Park Service, so there were, I think, about 35 people in that group. And so you get 35 ABTs each day. So you had, you know, somewhere around 100 ABTs to analyze by Wednesday. And then Haley pulls them all together and calculates, just goes through each one and asks those three questions. And, you know, yes, yes, no, yes, no, no, yes, 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 whatever. Uh, and then compiles them all. And so here's what we found with the National Park Service is this for anybody looking at this on um, YouTube, you can see the graph that I'm showing here. But what it's showing you is the first question about, did you make the mistake of putting the problem up front and the good news there was that pretty much nobody in professional scientists make that seem to make that mistake. They seem to get it, then they need to do a little bit of context. So we got a hundred percent rating there, meaning that um, everybody did do a good job with that. That's the way we frame this thing so that you're seeking a hundred percent for all three of these parameters. Um, if you're getting a low score, then you're in bad shape. So that was the first question. The second question was context. This is where we have learned is the biggest challenge of communication in general for our entire society everything to do with today in the world of too much information we are losing context and people are losing the ability to establish context and social media is absolutely selecting against context that's the problem with twitter is there's not enough room there to give you a chance to set up context everything goes right to the hell of contradiction and so that simple question was did you do a good job of putting all the right material upfront in the context? And the answer is no. That's where people really have the biggest problem. You can see color-coded it red there. And it's somewhere around 20% of people did a good job of that. Almost everybody didn't get that right. And then the third one is the simple question of, did you tell us upfront why this work is even important, why we should be interested in it? And the tool we use for that is the if-then tool, where you can say, you know, and this is important because if we can figure out what's going on with this, then we can do this. Uh, but we're not. And that also is a, a problem for a lot of people. So you could see the percentages there was maybe around 30% for the NPS crowd. Um, 
And then we do the video at the end of the first week in which we give guidance and we show these numbers and say, good start, but this is what you need to work on. You know, you're all in great shape with the problem statement being in the right place, but you got to start working now on the context, getting all the right material up front on that. And then you've got to give some thought to this information, this, uh, why this important statement. And so we just give clear pointers like that to the whole group. And there you see in, in week two, look what happened. Um, people were told exactly what to work on. They did. And the scores jumped up to about 30% for the worst one, probably about 60% for the better one. And then the, the problem one remains at 100%. And then the same thing. We do a video at the end of that week, giving more guidance, saying ne next week, now work on this. And that's what they did. They did even better. And so you could see over the course of three weeks, people's ABTs began to take a little bit more of the proper shape by taking into consideration these sorts of things. And the other thing, so that's, um, you could see here across the three main groups that we've run this with, um, the National Park Service and then GH Labs. Um, and then AJAS is a group that Mike Strauss and I have done with AAAS for the past, um, oh God, about four years or so, and it's high school seniors, and they end up approaching narrative very differently. So you can see that all three groups have trouble with that context one. They have stuff scattered all over. The question of, is the work important? They also start pretty low on that. I mean, these things, these are more non-literal things to think through. You know, there, there's a tendency to be literal-minded and assume, well, everybody thinks what I'm doing is important. No, you got to think a little more broadly than that. But the most interesting thing here with the, the high school kids is you notice that both of these groups, the professional scientists had no trouble knowing what context is from the outset or um, making sure they put the problem in the right place. But a lot of youngsters don't understand context at all yet. That's part of maturation. And as a result, when you ask them to tell us the ABT of the research project they're doing, they have a tendency to go right to the problem. You know, nobody's ever sequenced this gene, um, therefore I'm sequencing it. That's, they go right to the butt and then the therefore, and then they throw in a few things after the fact. They don't know how to begin very well with, we've got this disease and we've been working on it for a hundred years. And if we can get this one gene sequence, yada, yada, then we'll get all this sort of stuff, but right now. So we can see that again, quantitatively, that that's one of the problems, the shortcomings uh, of students starting out when it comes to communication with narrative. And this then becomes a summary of where we are now overall is that we see that problem is common with students only, but professional scientists seem to, by the time they've been doing some work, they've got a, got a pretty clear idea of what the context is. Quite often with, under, with, with high school kids, they've been given a project by their teacher and the teacher knows the context. They just don't quite yet have it figured out. Um, in terms of the contest, the context itself, making sure that the right material is in the context, that's a challenge for everyone. And then this importance thing is it's the most fixable of these three criteria, which is just use the the if then tool and use it up front. So these are the starting elements that we're using now with the DBT training. And there's more to work on beyond that. There is, if once people get all this down, and in fact, with the GH Labs groups, we're starting to move more uh, to a second level, which is to work on the red material and to give them coaching on the butt because dynamic. And, and again, this is where you get the strength, the power of storytelling rests in the specifics. The more specific in the right way you can make your ABT, the more powerful it becomes. And the more you grasp that sort of stuff, the deeper the intuition you develop and how to communicate. So Haley, um, we're about ready. Well, actually today we've started the next round with GH Labs. Um, how excited are you to analyze another big round of these ABTs? I'm very excited. Um, I, it was super fun doing all the other ones the past time, especially with GH Labs. Um, and just with the whole PCI index process, being able to see people grow throughout yes. the weeks is super cool. Yes. Um, and it's also just interesting for me seeing numbers and being able to see possible correlations between, oh, if people, you know, put the problem in the blue, which doesn't happen often, but if they do, then they probably aren't saying why things are important and other connections like that, which I think can help us at least untangle kind of why some of the mistakes people make are being made and what could be so hard to grasp about this whole process, which I think is super 
fun to explore. It really is. And it's it's very fun and gratifying for me because this, I think, in my wildest dreams is what I had hoped for 15 years ago, is to develop the ability to present, provide an analytical um, approach to looking at, at communication. Because traditionally, communication, you know, comes out of the humanities world. And granted, it's still 50% art. It's still got a lot of, of, of vague, multivariate, nebulous elements to it that can't be pinpointed quite like this. But having it be 100% visceral and art and just gut um, just doesn't work. And I have friends in, a in ad agencies, and they have these guys they call the intuitives, and they bring them into the room when it's time to try and craft a campaign. And those people have deep intuition. They can do some amazing things, but they can't analytically tell you where the ideas come from or how you can do them yourself or anything like that. And that just isn't very helpful. It's this analytical approach that gives people a little bit of a jump in terms of making sense of how this works, it's communication in the end is about 50% art and 50% science. And granted, there is that elusive art element, but there's definitely this firm structural thing. This is stuff that I began to feel 40 years ago as I first started looking at how movies are made. That's what Hollywood has understood from early on. There's two parts to telling a story in a movie. There's um, story structure and character. And the character stuff is the art part, and you can't really formalize that. There is very little science to character. But the story structure has got just tons and tons. That's what first hit me in film school was, oh, my goodness, look at all of this very objective analytical stuff that comes into play here. And then you turn around, and it used to be you looked at the movie studios, and they all had these story de departments that were all these mechanics, basically, working on these scripts day in and day out on these ba basic elements here of trying to get the story really well structured. Now, the sad news in today's world is they've gotten rid of most of those story departments and take a look at these big mass movies today. They just don't do very much on context anymore. They're they're really much more just but therefore adventures that just keep going, but this, therefore this, but this, therefore this, and not spending as much time on context. And that's fine for them just making theme park rides and things of that sort. But if you really want to have communication that's going to reach down inside of people, it's about this context and we can go on and on about that and today's political dynamics and the upcoming presidential race and where that comes into play there. But that's a whole separate show that we will do eventually. So on that note, thank you very much, Haley, and hope you enjoy working with us on this next round of the Day BT. Um, and I think I'll wrap things up here by saying everybody tune in to the next three episodes when we get those together to post. So plug for that which is that what we're going to do is two case studies looking at these two issues, two failed campaigns through the perspective of the ABT lens. And then the third episode will be a discussion of the whole bunch of our people where we're going to talk about those two case studies. The first case study is a failed conservation initiative, ballot initiative that took place in 2014 in the state of North Dakota called Measure 5 and involvement that and particularly one of our members of our group, Rick Nelson, was a major part of that and brought me in to work uh, in the aftermath of that to figure out what went wrong. And the second is an issue that happened last fall in Australia, which was a national referendum they ran called the Voice Referendum. And it was to try and give um, new rights to the Aboriginal nation there and to do some rewriting of their constitution to give a stronger voice to Aborigines in the constitution. That referendum failed pretty catastrophically as well. It, it lost in every state other than the, the main capital, the uh, ACT. And a lot of the people that backed it are kind of in shock over the outcome of that in the same way that they were in North Dakota after they, they lost so severely there. They lost 80-20 when the vote finally came out. So we're going to take a look at both of those case studies, um, one episode each on them. We'll have one guest for North Dakota and then another guest from Australia. And then the third episode will be the discussion of it. And I think it's, it's the first time we're ever doing a three-part series of that sort in this podcast, but they'll come together as a set and very much looking forward to recording all that. So on that note, we are back with the ABT Time podcast and stay tuned for the next three episodes. We will talk to you then. Um, happy 2024 in April. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>